Hi, I'm Alan Bresnik from Light Reading. We're speaking with Jeff Brown from Calix today. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Yeah, good morning, Alan. Happy to be here. Well, great. Uh, we're talking a lot about fiber today. So uh, we're seeing cable operators uh, a lot of interest in doing fiber builds. So I'm curious, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, that's right, Alan. We're seeing a tremendous uh, amount of interest and activity among mm -hmm. cable operators. So first, so for some context, you know, we have the two largest uh, cable operators in Comcast and Charter who are both, you know, publicly advocating their particular technology choice for Doxus mm -hmm. 4.0. Our customer target market is really below them. The next, say, 15 or so mid-sized tier two operators, as well as the, mm -hmm. you know, 200 or so uh, more regional cable operators that exist in the U.S. And we break these cable operators out into sort of three camps in terms of where they're at in their analysis. The first are, you know, really questioning the investment that they're going to have to make long term with moving to the Doxus 4.0 platform. Essentially, you know, they're going to have to re replace every single component in the network other than the coax itself. So as they are looking at those costs, they're also comparing it to de deploying fiber to the prem. So they're in that, you know, analysis stage, questioning stage. Second camp of operators have already deployed fiber to the prem, primarily uh, XGS 10 gig pawn. Uh, to be able to provide high-speed symmetrical services to their customers. And they've done it in an overlay fashion, kind of right on top of their existing Doxus uh, market uh, in order to serve you know, a particular customer segment to meet the needs. And as they're doing that, they're kind of looking at, okay, what is our long-term play going to be in terms of investment in either Doxus 4.0 or Fiber of the Prem? And then the third category of customer has already deployed the overlay network, trialed it, uh, tested it in various markets, ran the numbers, and basically said it's so obvious, and they've made a move uh, wholeheartedly to deploying fiber to the prem across their entire footprint, essentially in a you know what I, I call a CMTS type migration strategy over a number of years. And so you've seen some recent uh, announcements around that uh, regarding uh, operators who are in that third category. And you know, and we work across the board with all of these operators, try to help them through that analysis and what makes the best sense for them given their situation. Okay, so why are we seeing so much interest now? Is it purely uh, competitive reasons or other reasons as well? Yeah, I think the number one thing is uh, around OPEX savings when you're deploying mm -hmm. uh, a, uh, a fiber of the prem network, uh, you know, and also leveraging a software platform to give you some level of virtualization. There's tremendous operating uh, expense savings over the life of the network that you can uh, receive in our recent, you know, Blue Ridge uh, press release announcement. We, uh, they're, they're touting over 50% OPEX savings, certainly reduction in truck rolls, a lot of labor expense savings, also uh, considerable power savings, right? When you think about the the uh, the battery uh, backups that uh, aren't needed in a passive fiber network because there's so few uh, actually you know lit elements uh, tremendous power savings uh, increased um, focus from a operators on kind of reducing their overall carbon footprint um, you know scalability of course is huge and that you know ties into your question about the competition as other providers their competitors are deploying fiber. You know they want to be able to quickly meet the needs, the growing needs from a, both a bandwidth perspective as well as a marketing perspective. And I think the fourth consideration is speed to service launch. Right, just being able to deploy that fiber and very quickly get out the gate uh, uh, to their market with a high-speed symmetrical offering, and then build upon that as quickly as they needed. All those sort of things are favoring, uh, you know, fiber of the prem, and and in particular, uh, 10 gig X. Yes, Pond. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, with the uh, Congress having passed the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act last year, there's a lot of money that's going to be pouring into broadband, and a lot of that's going to be into fiber. I mean, something like $66 billion into broadband. How do you see that being uh, spent and deployed uh, in fiber over the next few years? Yeah, that's a really interesting topic. A lot of conversation around it. You know, the previous broadband funding programs were very centralized, you know, like RDOF and RES Connect, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, BEAD, you know, which they're targeting about $45 billion just for broadband to uh, deploy broadband to under and non-served areas. It's going to be very, um, uh, very much allocated at, at a local level, county, uh, regional type level. So it's going to um, it's going to result in some different type 
of uh, business models, you know. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, we talk about municipalities being interested in deploying fiber. You know, there are 18 states across the U.S. where there are regulations that actually prohibit, you know, munis from moving into that space. So right. what you see developing are a number of different kind of private public partnerships across the US. There's no one consistent approach. So I think mm -hmm. the important thing for cable operators is to try to understand how that funding's being allocated, uh, you know, look at the, the type of business models that are out there and what makes the most sense. So we talk with a lot of them about that. And then the biggest thing I would emphasize though, Alan, is not to design your network and architect it just to meet the government standards. Obviously there are some performance testing metrics. They're really important. You have to have that in your network and be able to uh, conduct those tests. And, you know, we work with operators. I think we just uh, made an announcement about our, you know, one a million uh, uh, performance testing tests each month that we do for mm -hmm. operators. But beyond the performance testing, you really want to build your network to provide that, you know, true care class end-to-end uh, network that extends all the way to the home. So right. going beyond just providing the minimum speeds, but also providing a quality, you know, in-home uh, broadband experience. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, the pandemic has shown uh, the need for broadband everywhere, and particularly the need for higher speeds everywhere. How do you think cable operators should be preparing their networks so they can deliver these higher speeds? And how much higher do you see the speeds going? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's not a, a, a set right or wrong answer. So that's probably where I get involved in working a lot with different type of operators mm -hmm. and on their on their architecture that go forward, you know, kind of uh, uh, future proofing their their network. Uh, there's a few things that that I would suggest, though, you know, that are uh, helping operators develop the best kind of network for them going forward and the best overall experience. The first is that concept of, you know, kind of virtualizing your access network, right? Deploying mm -hmm. a software platform that allows you to do things like as a typical example, you know, being able to do real time maintenance on certain components of your network without actually taking the rest of your network down. Minimizing customer downtime has been a real issue, you know, with traditionally with with Doxus upgrades. So with the fiber of the prem network, combined with that software platform, you have those kind of capabilities, which will reduce your OPEX, but more importantly, it'll improve your overall subscriber experience. I think the other um, thing that we recommend is as you're deploying you know, this fiber network, think about serving multiple segments. Cable operators are you know, very uniquely positioned to provide not just residential and business services, but also uh, you know, what we would call sort of X haul for the mobile network operators as they, you know, deploy 5G and cell densification across the country. So when it, when a vendor comes and talks about, you know, deploying a standalone pod network to serve one particular segment, that doesn't really make sense. It makes sense to deploy a unified access network utilizing the fiber to go out and serve multiple segments. And then lastly, in terms of the broadband speeds, um, you know, we see operators deploying overwhelmingly deploying, you know, 10 gig XGS pond today, a little bit of 10 gig EPON, but primarily XGS. In terms of future speeds, you know, it's going to be 50 gig or 100 gig. We are, uh, you know, the 50 gig standard was recently ratified. We are involved working with C, uh, with uh, Cable Labs on the 100 gig CPON initiative, you know, which is sometimes out, sometime out uh, for, for developing a standard and ratifying a standard. I think the important consideration here is when you think about the time lag from when standards are actually ratified to when they become you know, economically viable and the inflection point is reached where there's a huge number of shipments you know, in terms of making it cost effective for, for uh, cable operators. You know, there's, there's uh, XGS PON was the standard developed in 2015. And really last year was when the inflection point was reached where there are more uh, shipments being ordered by operators than you know, the previous version of, uh, of GPON. So we think that uh, XGS PON has, has legs for quite a while. We do see operators very interested in uh, making sure that they work with uh, standards-based technologies. So they have a rich uh, ecosystem with multiple vendors to ensure that they, they get, um, that there are plenty of um, availability of components across the supply chain, you know, given all of the uh, disruptions we've had in supply chain. So they're very interested in making sure they work with companies that, uh, that have, uh, that leverage industry standards and, um, and also, you know, just uh, making sure that, um, that they work with a, a wide variety of vendors that can offer them those capabilities. Okay, 
Thanks, Jeff. Bonus question for you. Uh, isn't it, is it inevitable that cable operators, all cable operators will go all fiber? And if so, how long do you see that transition process taking? Yeah, great question, um, Alan. Uh, you know, it will definitely vary, right? So um, we see uh, some operators that have uh, uh, made significant investments, not just from a, from a financial standpoint, but, you know, publicly advocating DOCSIS 4.0 and, you know, it might be difficult for them to um, to reverse that, you know, for some period of time. However, the broad uh, majority of cable operators that we deal with, you know, are actually deploying some form of both. And right. I think it'll dictate, you know, it'll be dictated based on business conditions, the level of competition they see in their in their particular markets, right? Um, based on you know all the funding we talked about not just from the government but also the amount of private funding coming into the market you know we envision certain markets will have you know multiple um, fiber based competitors not to mention you know the sort of the lower speed uh, lower sa satellite uh, type competitors you get like such as Starlink or from Project Kuiper so there'll be a number of competitors in the space and I think what will end up driving it is, uh, you know the the uh, the customer base, right? The customer set and the and the demands they have from their service providers that'll drive uh, the acceleration and the you know the cadence at which cable operators end up deploying fiber to the prem all the way to the home. Okay, Jeff, thanks for the insights. It'll be interesting to see where things uh, line up a year from now. Absolutely, would love to touch base again and and uh, let's see what other uh, public announcements have been made by operators in the space. Okay, great. Thanks for your time, Jeff.